morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Let's start by singing number 814. Number 814, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. And let's stand and sing.
thanks for a few minutes to talk to you as a church family. And, uh, you all have, have played a, a part in Alexander's life, and it's really a blessing to be here uh, this morning. Uh, certainly, this is something that typically you see in June. Uh, thank you to the pastor for saving the bulletins from June. <laughs> uh, uh, to recognize Alexander's, uh, Alexander's accomplishments. Uh, but between COVID and a summer uh, calculus course and uh, starting university tomorrow, we find ourselves here today. This journey began for Alexander uh, back in New Jersey. Faith and I lived in New Jersey uh, 1999 to 2009, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and every single year, so we enrolled him in homeschooling uh, starting in 2000, I'm going to say six or so, uh, whatever that was. And every single year, we would have a discussion of, you know, do we continue on or, or not? Uh, and, and we felt that the Lord was leading to carry on in homeschooling and Alexander. Certainly in the first few years wasn't part of that discussion, but certainly as the years uh, went on, he was part of that discussion. Graduation ceremonies are, of course, all called commencements, right? The commencement, they're beginning. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, when you arrive at, at a graduation ceremony, you often think of it as completely being an end. Uh, but, it, but it truly is a beginning. It really is the, the key, the launch, uh, launch pad to further education launch pad into uh, further decisions, the launch pad into the rest of his life. Uh, we know that that further education is going to shape Alexander and, and shape him into who he is to become and uh, provide him the, the basis for being what the Lord would have him to be. A number of years ago, Faith always set up the homeschool classroom. I, I didn't have, I, I can't play many role in that. Uh, you know, and truly, this was uh, an endeavor that, that Faith played a much, much larger role. I did. Uh, but they put a poster above Alexander's desk uh, on the bulletin board, and it's, it was Proverbs 1520a, which says, A wise man, oh, pardon, pardon, which says, A wise son maketh a glad father. Uh, and, and we're thankful that Alexander, even when it was difficult, and even, uh, even when uh, homeschooling at times may have seemed difficult, that he decided and continued to follow uh, with us and to follow the Lord. You've all watched Alexander through the years. You've all seen him grow up and he played various roles in his life. And, uh, it's just amazing when I think of where, when I look at pictures of 2009, uh, pictures of or 2010 of William being a newborn and, and look at Alexander basically being a little bit younger than William is now, uh, to think of how far he's come. And, and that's the blessing that's afforded to us as Christians saved Christians, being in a church family, and we certainly want to thank each and every one of you for the, the role that you played in Alexander's life and the influence that you had on his life. And we're so blessed that, that Alexander finished up his high school uh, despite, despite some health challenges and then also COVID that, that came along the way. And, and certainly there, there are road bumps that come uh, through homeschooling. It's not, uh, it's not chocolates and roses uh, every single week, uh, but there are there are blessings that can come with it. We're thankful for it. And, and certainly it's through a lot of prayer and encouragement uh, and, and just determination uh, that we watched him excel to get, get highest marks in his high school curriculum. Uh, and, and also uh, high marks when he took Calculus One uh, at the University of Pittsburgh this summer. And he applied to a Bible college in California and is enrolled uh, in a course there that he's already started, uh, received a scholarship for that. He's also enrolled at Acadia University to start his uh, Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Business uh, tomorrow. When we see how the Lord has moved and guided, uh, we, we can't help but be pleased. And it certainly is our prayer, our prayer as a family, uh, that Alexander would continue to seek the Lord for everything in his life, uh, knowing that true direction and true wisdom comes from the Lord. You know, we started this journey whatever, 13, 14 years ago, whatever it was. Uh, there certainly was nothing traditional about homeschooling. Uh, 2020 has certainly changed that uh, with, with the vast majority of uh, individuals being suddenly homeschooled uh, in the, at the end, of the end of the last school year. Um, and 
certainly university is starting out fairly similar to homeschooling in many, many respects. The, the classes are online, and uh, there, there's many aspects of, of his education now that he's about to embark into that certainly uh, remind, us of, remind us of his homeschooling experience. Uh, fortunately, he has, uh, he has set up his room. Uh, we commented to him that I think he has the best room in the house now. Um, <laughs> so I'm not quite sure how you swung that, but you know, we all end up swinging by to hang out in Alex's room now. It's <laughs> funny how you move a bed in a different direction. And it totally changes the room. But anyhow, uh, and certainly, you know, homeschooling uh, years ago, that would have been the only route that you would have received your diploma in the mail. Uh, that's certainly not the only route now. Instruction now, so, or instruction online. Um, the mail. I, I certainly, the only other, uh, or other incremental uh, thought I have when I, when I think of Alexander is, is just the brevity of life, and, and certainly, uh, everyone will tell you that. And when you're 20, uh, I can't do the math now, 20, 20, whatever. When I had Alexander. Uh, it seems like an eternity to come, uh, and, 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 and you know intellectually it's not, but uh, it, it certainly does go by quicker. And even the final years of his uh, homeschooling uh, race by uh, James 4, 14, whereas, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little, a little while. And certainly, uh, Certainly, his life has gone by, uh, to this point, has gone by quickly. His childhood has gone by quickly. But, uh, we love our boy, and it's, it's with, uh, with joy and, and with pride uh, that as a mom, and, pardon me, as a dad and as a mom, uh, that, we're, that we want to present him with this diploma. Uh, we know that you've worked hard, and you know, we're looking forward to what you're going to become. And Alexander would present to this diploma with the highest honor.
and uh, Second Timothy. Uh, called the series, then ready to go. Paul is. These are his last words. Second Timothy is, and he's ready to go, ready to go to heaven. And uh, we're going to look at tonight the promise of life in the first eight verses of Second Timothy. And then uh, remember Tuesday night testimony. We're still looking for something, as far as I know, for this Tuesday's testimony. And uh, praise the Lord for the ones we've had so far. And then on Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study, continuing our series on Romans. Uh, this time we're just going to go right to my wife's special. So my wife's going to come and she's going to sing. Find your spot. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but we are looking at the whole chapter this morning. But we will start our reading at verse number 22, and we'll read down to verse number 28. First Kings chapter 20, we'll start reading at verse 22, and let's actually read down to verse number 33. 22 to 33. 
And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. What happened in the first 21 verses is Syria besieged Samaria and tried to take the city. And God defended them and gave a great victory. But God says at the return of the year, they'll come back. And it says in verse 23, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. And do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms, and number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and were against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians and hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and there was a wall that fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure he will save thy life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother Ben-Hadad. And he said, Go ye bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadad, or I said that's as far as we read, but let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the passage of Scripture that's before us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for um, preserving it, inspiring it, preserving it for us today. And I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful uh, truths that we learn from this passage as we learn that you're not just the God of the hills, but you're the God of the valley. We thank you, Lord, that in our difficult times and the trials that we face, that you're still the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at these things this morning, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to understand them and apply them to our lives. I pray, Lord, that if there is someone who's going through a valley, I pray that you'll minister to that heart today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Sometimes you read the passage of Scripture and you just got to say, What? <laughs> They said, what? You read this passage of Scripture, and, and verse number 28, the, thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. You're just like, what? What, what did the Syrians say again? What was it that they said? that They said he's God of the hills, but he's not the God of the valleys. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I wouldn't want to be Syria right about now. I wouldn't want to be the one that said he's God of the hills, but not the God of the valleys. To think that someone would make such a statement about the Lord our God. And God, in essence, in the text says, don't they know who I am? Don't they know who they're talking about? They'll find out, that's for sure. I'm not just God of the hills but I'm God of the valleys. Do you know that today? We seem to have the idea, as Christians even, 
that God is just the God of the mountains. He's God when things are going well. He's God when our problems aren't that big. He's sovereign when things are going as planned, when we're healthy, when there's money in the bank, when we have a good job, when everything is exactly as we want it. Then when we're in the valley, it's easy to lose faith, isn't it? In the valley, when you lose your job, when you get bad news from the doctor, when things fall apart, that's when you ask the question, can God? Can God help me? Can God make a difference? Is He able to help in the valley? But you look at the Scriptures and you find out just because your circumstances have changed doesn't mean that God has changed. He's still the same. The God of the hills is still the God of the valley. Do you know Him today? Think with me this morning of the God of the valley and look at this text. We see, number one, the mercies of God. The mercies of God. Aren't you glad that God is merciful? Nobody is as merciful as our God. And I think of how what mercy is. Mercy is God being good to us when we don't deserve it. We never deserve it. The first mention of mercy in the Bible was to a man that never deserved it. The first mention of mercy is Genesis chapter 19 with the man Lot. God was merciful to him. There Lot was a a saved man, a just man, a righteous man living in Sodom. He had had given his daughters to marry men of Sodom. He was there calling the men of Sodom brothers. There he was as God was ready to destroy the city of Sodom. There Lot was lingering in the city. But the Lord was merciful unto him and took him out of the city and delivered him. God showed his mercy. And friend, in our text, that's what we see. We need God's mercy today. And God shows his mercy in the text because I think of the man Ahab. Did Ahab deserve any of God's help? Deserve any of God's help? There's not a more wicked king in the earth than Ahab. But why is Ahab still here? Why is he still king of Israel? Why is he receiving help from God? Because of God's mercies. They are new every morning. I think number one here, we see that by his mercies, we are not forsaken. By his mercies, we are not forsaken. You know, it's a miracle to me that God is still interested in the children of Israel at this point in time. It's a miracle to me that he's still paying attention to Ahab and his kingdom. Think of it. They, they turned to Baal worship. They hardened their hearts against God. That Even though they saw the fire fall from heaven and the nation cried, the Lord, he is God, Ahab is still trying to lead the nation to worship Baal and away from God. The prophets of God are still running for their lives as Ahab is on the throne. Jezebel is still queen, and there's still a sinful nation. And the fact that God is still interested in them, God is still defending them. You read those first 21 verses, they're not looking at God, they're not interested in God. The Syrians have surrounded the city, and they're trying to take everything from them, and and they're not at all praying to God. But God still was merciful to him. And God still delivered the city. He is a merciful God. It's by His mercies that we are not forsaken. And then it's by His mercies that we are not consumed. We don't have time to read the first 21 verses, but just to see a few of them. You look at uh, verses 1 to verse 1 to 4. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses, and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. And the king of Israel said, No, no, that's not what you read. The king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, 
I am thine and all that I have. It doesn't even draw a line. You know, when the devil comes and tries to take something from you, you got to draw the line. You got to say no. You got to say you can't have that. You can't have my, uh, my integrity. You can't have my purity. You can't cause me to go that way. I'm drawing a line in the sand. You can't have my children. You can't have my wives as, as uh, the wives of the city of the men of Israel. But Ahab didn't even care to draw the line. He just said, okay, you can have it. The next day, uh, he says, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children. And then he says, Yet I'll send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. Now he decides to draw the line. Okay. Now that, now that he's taken my rock collection, <laughs> now that he's gone and he's taken my favorite picture off the wall, I can't part with that. The rest I was okay too. Doesn't seem like a guy that's ready to fight. Doesn't seem like a guy that has any idea what he can do against Syria. And you see in the passage how he talks to his servants and he says, He's working mischief against me. Of course he is. Don't you see it? You should have known that the first time. He's working mischief against me. He's, he's trying to t- take, take advantage of me. He's trying, to, he's trying to belittle me and abuse me and all these things. And Ahab's a hopeless soul here. And he's not even thinking. There's not a mention in the passage that he said, let's call on the Lord. He didn't say, let's trust in God. He never... He never thought anything about what God might be able to do to help in this situation. And he's got no fighting chance. And then all of a sudden, verse 13, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord. There's a guy that didn't deserve it. There's a guy that had no chance. But God, who is rich in mercy, stepped up and defended him. He was still there to fight the second battle by the mercies of God. The second battle brings him down to a valley. And friend, you might be in a valley today, a valley of circumstances, a valley of a hopeless situation, a valley where the enemy is all around you. Where, but remember this, you wouldn't be anywhere if it weren't for the mercies of God. You consider your life. Consider how you were dead in trespasses and sins. Consider how you were lost without hope, without God. No chance at eternal life. No way of saving yourself. Not even a, a thought of God in your mind as there were unprofitable, none seeking after God. But God who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Friend, praise God for God's mercy. God's mercies are seen in this passage of Scripture. His mercies are seen in the valley. Then number two, we see the majesty of God. The majesty of God. Verse 22, the prophet comes and he says, the Syrians are going to come back. At the return of the year, he says, the king of Syria will come up against thee. Christian, remember this. The devil's always going to come back. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You, you had a victory one time, praise the Lord. He's going to come back. He's going to keep fighting you. He's going to keep trying to devour you. He's not going to st- stand off. And the Bible tells us how he, he's seeking whom he may devour, going about, walking about. And we got to resist the devil, fight back against the devil, oppose the devil. You got to keep being willing to fight the good fight of faith. You see in the text that he had 32 kings when he came the first time. They replaced the same army and they put 32 new kings in their place. Uh, And they number an army in verse 25, according to the army that they had lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot. 
They come back just as strong as ever. They're coming back to fight the people of God. But when they come back, you know what they're going to find out? They're going to find out just how big God is. They're going to find out just how powerful God is. He's just as big as he, in the valley as he is in the hills. And he delivers in the valley. You know, I dare say that we as Christians, as people, we don't like valleys, do we? When thinking about valleys, thinking about difficult times, thinking about trials, thinking about testings, we don't like that. We'd rather every day be a walk in the park. We'd rather every day having it easy. We don't mind problems coming just as long as they're small problems. We don't like them being so many problems just as long as we can find a way to manage them on our own. We, we don't really like to have the, the big problems. But can I tell you something? If it weren't for the big problems, you'd have no idea how big your God is. God is so big. God is so powerful. Small problems, if all you had was small problems, you'd have a small God. But when you have big problems, you realize just how mighty your God is. And you see in the text that God is mighty. He's almighty in every place. I love how the Syrians here in the text, they had a theory. You know, sometimes it's just good to hear someone's theory, you know. Uh, Nathan, he loves to have theories, you know, as to why something might happen, you know. He's just like, well, that happened because he makes something ridiculous up, and it just, it makes me smile, you know. And I, I, love, I love hearing Nate just talk and think things out, you know. And uh, he's a little boy. He's expected to not, you know, get it all the first time. But here's these men are, these Syrians, trying to explain how they lost the first time. Well, I'll tell you how we lost. Uh, well, Kerry Price just didn't stop everything, and unfortunately, you can't win a hockey game when you don't score any goals. But anyway, that's how we lost. Uh, we lost because, you know, uh, really, the other team, they just, uh, they got lucky. They got a few bounces, but really, we were the better team, you know. We, we if we tried, that's, uh, that's how guys talk, you know. We, we say, I know we lost, but really, we were better. We'll win next time. Well, the Syrians, they had the same mentality. They said, listen, they're God. They're God. He's the God of the hills. That's where we fought them. We fought them at the hill of Samaria. If we take them down into the valley, down into the plain, their God won't be able to help them there because their God's just God of the hills and not the God of the valley. And it's just like, don't they know that he is God? But you look at the, the fact is, God is God in every place. Mountain or valley hill or plain, day or night, God is still God. He says in verse 28, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he's not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they went and they fought in the valley. They went and they went down into the plains, off of the mountaintops, they got down low and fought the enemy in the trenches. And God proved that he's still God down there. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, what your circumstance is, what your situation is, God's still just as mighty as he ever was. He hasn't changed. He's still the God of the valley today. Then he's not just almighty in every place, but he's almighty over all people. You look at this text and you compare these two, ar these two armies and it, it's just a... A massive size difference. A massive difference between the two sides. Uh, the Bible tells us that the Syrians, they, they filled the whole mountain, the whole valley. They filled the plain. They were just everywhere you looked, there was a Syrian. There was a Syrian. There were just so many of them. And Israel was pitched there like, it doesn't even say two little flocks of goats. It says two little flocks of kids. <laughs> little flocks of baby goats. They weren't very big. They weren't very strong. There was just a tiny little army of the nation of Israel. They were seriously outmatched. Well, what difference does it make for God to save with many or by few? He's God regardless of the numbers. We've got to stop paying attention to the odds and pay attention to our God. There's a quote I heard that said, you've got to stop. Don't tell your problem. Your, don't tell God how big your problems are, but tell your problems 
how big your God is. <laughs> Tell them how big your God is. I like that. I think of another fight in the valley. You know what this reminds me of? A fight in the battle of the, a fight in the valley of Elah. Does anyone know what fight happened in the valley of Elah? Any Sunday school kids know what one that was? You've heard the story. It was about a little boy named David and a giant named Goliath. There they were in the valley of Elah. Israel was on one mountainside. Uh, the Israel, uh, Israel on one side, Philistines on the other. The valley in between. The Philistine kept coming out saying, Who will fight me? Defy the armies of the living God. And everyone looked at him and they were scared. They said, he's too strong. He's too powerful. There's no way that we could fight against him. But the shepherd boy, a teenage boy, we don't know how old he was, but he wasn't that old. His oldest three brothers, they were in the army. He had the other brothers in between and then him. And he wasn't even, the, if the fourth oldest wasn't old enough to be in the army, David couldn't have been that old. And there he is bringing some lunch to his brothers. And his brothers are there and they're, and they're scared to death of this Philistine. But David says, who is he that defies the armies of the living God? You know what David did? He didn't, he didn't take the size of the Philistine into the equation. He took the size of his God. He wasn't looking at, at the giant Goliath and saying, wow, did you see that guy? He was looking at the Lord Almighty and saying, I know I can win with the Lord on my side. You know, if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Christians, don't get caught up in the odds. Don't get caught up in the helpless situation, but get caught up in God. Get caught up in His power, His glory. As Jonathan said, there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. He's almighty over all people. You know, you might be in the valley today. You might be in a place where someone says, well, that's a hopeless situation. It's like they hear the news and they just, all they say is, I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I wish I could say something better, but all I can say is, I'm sorry, a dead man walking, it's too bad, really, it's just too bad. Fred, your God is bigger than your problem. He's still able to help us in every situation, whether it's a mountain or a valley. God is still God. And he's able to help us in troublesome times. You read the passage of Scripture and they go down into this valley and they fight against the Syrians. And the Bible tells us how they wrought a great victory. And one day, one battle, they slew 100,000. Then they go and the Philistines hide in some city and a wall falls on them. And from that experience, 27,000 more pass away. God gave them a great victory. Because He's not just the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. And He'll see you through in difficult times. But this text this morning, you wish it ended better. You really do. But Ahab just seems to always end the wrong way, doesn't he? We saw the majesty of God and the mercies of God. I call this third point the mockery of God. And God's not mocked, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But to think that God reached down and, and delivered this wicked king. God in his mercy, when he didn't deserve it, he, he did nothing to gain God's favor. He was just in all his ways he was doing, he was just opposing God left and right. And God still saved him. God still helped him. And then as soon as God gives him the victory, he turns around and starts fraternizing with the enemy. He makes a peace treaty with the enemy. The Bible, as you read this passage, he, he, the Syrians are like, oh, we lost the battle, time to, time to cut our losses, time to just get out of here. Maybe we'll disguise ourselves and trick the king of Israel into showing mercy on us. And they dress in sackcloth and put ropes on their heads and come to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. 
And he said, is he yet alive? He is my brother. Because everybody has that brother who just tried to steal all their gold and silver and kill their wives and children. And that's the kind of brother we've all had in our lives. <laughs> no, I don't know what he's doing here. I don't know why he'd think that this is his brother. But they hear him say, he's my brother. They say, thy brother ben Hadad. And they bring him up into the chariot and makes a comp compromise, a covenant. And uh, I call this, number one, a foolish compromise. A foolish compromise. A compromise that never should have happened. Ahab, number one here, he forgot what God had done. He forgot. Why is he making this compromise? Why is he doing this? Because he forgot what God had done. You say, how could he? I mean, it just happened. It was today. It was this moment. It literally, we just finished the battle, and now he's got no, collect, no recollection of what God had done. Well, that's just how Ahab always was. He always forgot what God had done, and God's part of the equation. You remember when Elijah called down fire from heaven, and, and the people said, the Lord, he is the God. It was a proof that God is God and not Baal. And then he goes back and he tells Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Nothing about what God had done. He's always forgetting what God has done. He's not paying attention to the fact that God has delivered him. Like with the, son, the children's lesson was this morning. It's like he thought that he had done it himself. It's like he thought that somehow he was the great king that had orchestrated this great victory. And we all know it was the work of Almighty God. He was like those nine lepers, you know? There was the one, the one that turned around and said, thank you. But there was the nine who just left Jesus and never turned back to say thanks. Never turned back to give God the glory. Just went back to their lives how they had lived before. Only one turned back and glorified God. You know, how foolish we are when we do the same thing. You say, Ahab, what a terrible guy in this passage. But how often does God pick us up? How often does he help us? And we forget to give him the glory for it. We forget. We forget what God has done. I appreciate Miss Mary's testimony this morning because that's something I honestly forget to give the God the glory for, to think that we live in a... a a place where we're so blessed that we have no cases over here in Nova Scotia, and God has been so good to us, and we're griping about masks, but instead we should give God the glory for what he's done for us, and praise God for how good he is to us. And uh, Ahab forgot what God had done. The number two, Ahab forgot what the enemy wants. What did this king of Syria want? He wanted Ahab's kingdom. He wanted Ahab's food. He wanted Ahab's wealth. He wanted to plunder Ahab. He wanted Ahab's destruction. But there Ahab is with the enemy in his chariot discussing a peace treaty. A pre peace treaty that Ben-Hadad had no intention of keeping. There he is sitting with the enemy, negotiating with the enemy when this enemy wants him dead. And friend, don't we know what the devil wants for us? Don't you know that he's not your friend? He wants your destruction. He wants your demise. We seem to forget what the wages of sin is. The wages of sin is death. Can I tell you that Romans chapter 6 is actually speaking to God's people, encouraging them not to go down the wrong path because the sin still brings its consequences. Still, sin still brings destruction in our lives. The wages of sin is still death, and we know we're saved eternally. But you still reap what you sow. And you see in the passage, not just the foolish compromise, but you see the fatal consequence. Ahab's foolish compromise leads to a fatal consequence. As the chapter ends, you should read it on your, when you have time, but the prophet comes again. Another son of the prophet comes, and this time he does a great picture there. He gets another prophet to smite him. And you say, what's he doing there? The first guy says, I won't do it. I don't think I'd have done it either. You know what I'd be? I'd be dead. <laughs> I'd be eaten by the lion because that's what happened to the guy that said, no, I won't smite him. So the second one, he, he smites him. 
And he goes to the king and acts like he's a wounded soldier. And he talks about how someone was put into his care and he was told to not lose that man. And if he did, it would be life for life or he'd have to pay the money or whatever. And he says, and I lost him. So what are, what is my, what, what's my judgment? And the king says he has no problem, you know, calling out the sin in someone else's life. It's his own sin that he can't seem to see. But he says, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I pointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And uh, God said to Ahab, because you let go the king of Syria, that's going to be your wages. Your life for his life. Thy life for his life. Thy people for his people. Ahab wasn't happy about that, but can I tell you something? It happened just like God said it would. Syria never kept that peace treaty. Syria didn't give back those cities. Ramoth Gilead was Israel's, and they never gave it back. So three years later, Ahab's like, they didn't keep their treaty. No, duh! He's the enemy. He never intended to keep the treaty. And so he goes to fight at Ramoth Gilead, and he dies. Why did he die? Because he reaped what he sowed. He said, I, I, I don't, I, I'm going to save my enemy. I'm going to keep my enemy. I, God's lifting me up out of the gutter, but I'm going to jump back in. And he reaped what he sowed. You see, the fact is, God is not mocked. I call at this point the mockery of God, but God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that showeth to the flesh shall reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. He reaped what he sowed. And Christian, the question for you is, do you get the message? God is the God of the valley. When you're low, when you're going through a hard time, you have a God who is able he can help you in every situation. He can, he can be your stay. He can be your rock. He can get you through one way or the other. He'll see you through to glory. But if you take his mercy and his might and get up out of the valley and then go right over to the enemy. If you've been washed with the blood of Jesus, given eternal life, born again by the Spirit of God, and keep choosing the old ways, the old paths, eventually you will reap what you sow. Unless you repent and ask God for his mercy. And Christian, don't forget this. If it weren't for God, where would you be today? If it had not been the Lord on our side, now may Israel said, the enemy would have swallowed us up quick. They would have swallowed us alive, is what the psalmist says. That's where we'd be. But God in his mercy saved us, delivered us. So don't spurn the mercies of God. Don't go back to the world. Don't jump back into the valley. But as Jesus said to that woman, go and sin no more. We you go on, live righteously when you consider the deliverance that God has given to you. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the passage of Scripture that we looked at this morning. Lord, it's such an encouraging passage, and at the same time, it's such a devastating passage when you think of how Ahab responded to the mercy and the might of God that you showed him. And I pray, Lord, that we won't follow that mistake. I pray that we will live our lives to your honor and to your glory. And for those of us that have been saved from sin, I pray that we will determine to no longer live therein, but to live the way that you'd have us to live. And I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they'll be saved today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. Is there someone who doesn't know the Lord as their Savior? If you don't know him today, I just ask you to raise your hand. And I'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Anyone at all this morning? Our right, Father, thank you for the time we've had in your word. I pray that you'll bless now as we sing this last song. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I believe the last song is number 361. We're going to sing the one we skipped. 361, The Lily of the Valley. And let's stand together and sing.